Valpurgis and Beltane blessings. Yo, Pan, yo, Pan, I am a man, said the great god Pan. And I love Valpurgis into Beltane. And uh, if, just a quick one, if you're on Facebook, we're going to broadcast a BR313 uh, Witches Sabbath live special tonight with some friends. And uh, talking about megaliths, magic, mythology, mysticism in a bit of fun and a light-hearted way. And uh, that will eventually be broadcast on the BR313 channel. So uh, here we are, getting ready for the morning dew in the morning. And uh, this will be like, I guess it'll be like, you know, the Queen's message on Christmas Day. Well, this is your version of the Queen's message. I should have wore a tiara and a, and a white dress to do this, you know. Uh, but, you know, imagine if I was a druid, which I'm not. But imagine if I was a druid and I was delivering a, a Beltane proclamation to the tribe. Well, that's the day and it'll be looking back at the year that was and the what's to come it will be there will be an element of prophecy here but it will always always all about the love okay so remember you're you're in a tribe you're not alone and me playing i should put on a welsh accent hey boy oh here's the years ahead i always thought like i was i was a good name for a like a kind of a, a character for a, a a uh, a cosplay druid would be would be a Welsh guy with a, a staff and uh, you know a yurt rapist type, and he has a name like uh, you know Di of Syphilis, you know D A I second name Sif o, o, o Syphilis, O F and <laughs> Syphilis. <laughs> Di, Di, I'm Di of Syphilis. I and uh, hello by oh I'm Di of Syphilis. I am a druid. Yes, I am. Come into my yurt and I will give you my mighty staff. Yes. I am Di of Syphilis, yeah, and Di also has a good name for a, 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 a Jewish cosplay character. No offence to the lovely Welsh people out there, but I just thought that we, it's making them Welsh just seemed appropriate. And, uh, the, you know, anyway, so here we are, Valpurgis, going into Beltane, a time of reflection. Now... First of all, those of you who are hanging out in these witchy poo groups, you know the ones where you have these ones who look like Nora Batty, and they uh, they post pictures of hot Wiccan chicks with messages like "A witch always dress wears black," you know, and it's these kind of Stevie Nicks cosplay things. Well, you you won't you won't enjoy this video. Likewise, if you're one of the York rapists on there, another uh, diasyphilis. I think my friend is coming over to say hello to me. No, he's not. Die of syphilis and <laughs> die of syphilis and uh, uh, those types who are, think by saying the goddess enough times they will get laid until they find out that the options are Nora Batty types who call you know and not they don't look like the the hot chicks they put on the put on the memes they put up like this witch has power you cannot deal with and they're like a hot chick you know. Yeah, right. <clears throat> uh, this is for real pagans, not neo-pagans and Wiccan Abrahamics. And uh, so, yeah, so, you know, that's another thing too. Don't let anyone believe that Beltane, because it's a fertility festival, is about, like, having, putting your willy in everything. So, like, that was invented in the 60s by, that was invented in the 60s by, uh, smelly hippies who are trying to ball some spiritual chicks you know we gotta you know you know in ancient, in ancient pagan times I, you know we everyone ball everyone else you know that that's how the that's it was so spiritual i'm really spiritual what, what sign are you you know that kind of thing that didn't happen that's all bollocks <coughs> that was also <coughs> that, that was also part of the degeneracy that christians put upon our ancestors our pagan ancestors, if you read into it, were very traditional in their relationships. They had, you know, married couples. They were lovers. They, 
Uh, if you look at all these pictures, you know, even in Pompeii, those pictures up on the wall are, if they're not in a brothel, which is just, that's just a brothel, but if they're not in the people's homes, that's a married couple celebrating their sex life. They, just because they were sexually open about their sexuality doesn't mean that they were, you know, free love hippies but fucking everything in sight. That was a myth that showed, that was part of that whole free loves thing to degrade women that was done in the 60s. To turn women, and you know, it was free love for the men. It wasn't for the women. They had to, that's because they'd legalized abortion. Well, whatever, it's all the other thing, right? But, so don't be caught up in this thing that's because it's a fertility pet. You know, get around my maypole, bio. You know, it doesn't mean that, you know. And uh, it wasn't like that at all. They were in, they were, the, things like the maypole festivals were innocent children, fe child festivals. And they were not about like, you know, balling, babe, balling, pagan, wicked babes, you know. So our pagan ancestors were very traditional that way. Don't you, don't you fall into that hippie sixties commie trap? So, so in Valpurgis, why it's called people? If you want to know why it's called Valpurgis night, there was a saint, a German saint called Saint Valpurgia, and she. This is, a, this is a great story. You know the way. You know the way Christians have stole all the pagan, co-opted and appropriate all the pagan holidays for themselves. Like a sow and all you know, Saints Day and you know Yule, Christmas and e Ostara, Easter. Well, what's brilliant about Valpurgis Night, Valpurgis, Valpurgis, is that the pagans stole one back from them. Saint Valpurgia was a, a, a the story, you know, usual story. She was she she was a martyr for Christianity, but German German witches were very clever. They stole. They stole her, her feast day, and in a and in an inversion, would go to Mount Brocken and return her, you know, spirits, you know, in a spiritual, almost alchemical level, back to the old fate. So it was a way of taking one of their own and bringing them onto our side, and this is why it drove the Lutherans and the. Uh, you know the the sort of like the Calvinist and the Presbyterian sects in Germany and saying because uh, the the pagans dared to take back one of our one of theirs and bring them back into the fold and uh, a brilliant thing when you think about it thank you thank you German witches and then they would have all that on, and then they would begin then then they would next following morning when the dew rose from the the morning mist they would the the witches uh, just like the early pagans did would cleanse themselves with the the morning dew and begin fresh the new year and that's what you do you don't have to be a virgin you don't have to be anything you, just be, you can be a man or a woman well it's definitely it's generally a female thing to do in the morning to bathe yourself in the morning dew but uh on beltane and the men make and tend the fires and purify the animals and cattle by by in our in, in Gaelic paganism, I've stopped using the term Celtic paganism because a lot of what people call Celtic paganism really only existed in the Gaelic world, like Ireland, Scotland, and the Isle of Man, such as Bel Beltana, which is how it's really pronounced, Beltana. And uh, so Beltana in Ireland would was uh, Bieltana was really about a purification festival. So all they would light two f f fires, and then they would move animals and food and things to be eaten and consumed and even themselves processions through this is what the processional thing is a very powerful ancient thing through the two standing fires as a way of cleansing and purification and of course the own you were not allowed to light a fire until the, the fire was lit at Ishnok in the center of Ireland and then fires would be like, you know, Lord of the Rings when the beacons all went off and they, they contacted Gondor. That's literally, that, that, that comes from ancient Ireland. And then f on the, from each different hilltop, they would see the fire lighting and then they would light their own fire. And it's reckoned that, and it's incredible too, from the burning of the first fires in Ishnok, within eight minutes, think about that, eight minutes, because there was no light pollution back then. You could see the fire from like 20 miles away. Within eight minutes, Every bel belt in a fire would be s lit in Ireland, as well as over in the across the sea in the Isle of Man, which would be watching over to Ireland for the fires, and also over in Scotland, which would be watching over to Ireland to see the fires lit up on the coast of Ulster. 
And so that's how seriously they took it. Now, but Beltane, Beltane is much, much older. It's a much, much older festival. And how we know this is, it goes right back to Neolithic times, is because of the solar alignments and several megaliths in Ireland that are specifically aligned with the, the rising of the sun on May Day morning. And uh, on uh, and that's, the, I think, Four Knox is one and definitely the sun, one at Lock Crew and a few others around the country. And there's probably lots of them all over the place. Well, they've all, they were all gone or been moved or whatever. But the, we do know for a fact that the festival, the May Day festival itself went way back, way, way back to Neolithic times. And how it got the name uh, Bjeltene is, or Beltane is interesting because they don't really know for sure. Now, I've heard Wiccan ratbags say there's a Celtic goddess called Bell and it's a goddess of the sun. No, there's no Celtic goddess called Bell. This is the like the Ostara, the Ostara, you know, Ishtar nonsense, um, Easter bullshit. The Bell was a Semitic pagan goddess of the sun. I think a Assyri Assyrian. Don't, I'm not a huge expert on that, the paganism of the Middle East, but I think Assyrian. And that's where that comes from. Now, there's a very, it's a very plausible theories have arisen that make a lot of sense that the the Celtic pagans, Gaelic pagans, Celtic pagans, whatever, but but the Celtic tribes in general, like all pagans, adopted deities from other cultures. So uh, this was this is very this is this is like when the Vikings were in Ireland, you had people in Dublin. They they were talking to Vikings and they would say. Okay, what well, you know? What's what's the name of your your thunder god or whatever or sun god or blah blah blah? And then the Vikings might mention to the locals, "Have you ever heard of Thor?" And they go, "No, no. What's the story with him?" And he goes, "Well, he has a hammer and he chases Loki across the sky. He represents lightning and tricks." And oh, very good. I think I, I think I'll incorporate Thor into my pantheon. This goes on in Hinduism, the same same con basic root, and. Uh, the the same the same basic thing goes on there, and um, this is what makes paganism so beautiful. There's no even there's no there's no intolerance as towards other pagan religions. We don't fight over different versions of paganism. We 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 sit down and talk and say, "Oh, I like the way you've done that," and they incorporate Minerva was the the Roman goddess of warfare, the crossroads, and so on, and she was based, of course, on Athena, the 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 Greek goddess of strategy and war and, and things like that, and the the Gallic the Gallic Capel Celts adopted Minervan worship and associated it with uh, wells, and so a kind of a. A, a well a well type goddess can incorporate into that and that's why i think the the baths the roman baths in bath in in england i think they started out as being dedicated to a pagan goddess we don't know which one celtic and then the romans took them over and they i think they devoted them to minerva and then when the Romans left and the pagans were still around. They continued to venerate Minerva. Now, the, how does it relates to Beltane is uh, there's quite fascinating and interesting evidence that it's to do with Baal veneration. Because Baal, at the time of the Roman conquest of its most land, right into Britain and up to the Scottish borders, Baal was a very commonly venerated god a fertility god among of the romans and so it's they there are real evidence of records of literal baal worship going on in scotland in the 1700s that was left over from scots gales or picks coming into contact with the romans they weren't always fighting they would have been you know they would have been not black and white but they would have drifted up to england and place well what became england so it's very possible that Beltane is actually based on Baal. The name, now the name. The festival itself is independent of that. But it has that name today. It's, you know, it's not absolutely confirmed. But what a theory. It's fascinating. 
that the Roman army gave the god that that the Gaelic, the later Gaelic pagans adopted for their May 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 Eve and May Time festival. And you still go around Ireland today, and you still see pubs called the May Queen and the May Pole, and all this stuff. And the call, you know, there's still that legacy is still very strong here. And ultimately, it all goes back to the in the Europeans. Uh, speaking of which, fresh milk, raw milk, is one of the best things you can put inside your body. It is full of natural antibiotics. And if you're prone to stomach ailments, this is it. Now, you, you vegans are going to jump on now and go, we would have meant to drink cow's milk, okay? No, no, we were. About 6,000 years ago, out of the blue, for some reason, uh, Indo-Europeans developed a gene that allowed them to digest lactate acid, i.e. milk. And from that, they were able to eat things like butter and ghee and cheeses and so on and not just the flesh of the animal and because this gave them so much strength and so much good health raw milk now is not the same as pasteurized milk and gave them so much good health that they were able to move into india and move into europe and spread the pagan and hindu cultures that we have today and this is why terms like ma for mother is commonly used on, on, in Europe and Asia and so other things. The, and this is why also they, they worshipped the sacred cows. Why, why literally a whole, across a whole sway from Sri Lanka all the way to Iceland, there was cow veneration, bull veneration. And the, the, the Icelandics did not bull veneration, but, they, but remember, it's not the Vikings. Remember, the Vikings are 50% are a mixture of Irish and Irish pagans and... Norwegians, so that it spread to there, and that's why you know you had the cattle raid of Cooley, the Tyburn Kruger, and the Tyne, and all these epics regarding cows, sacred cows, sacred cattle. So we have the sacred cow in Hindu Hinduism because the ancient ancestors six thousand years ago developed the gene that allowed them out of the blue, which is kind of magical when you think about it, to digest lactic acid. So those of you who say humans are not supposed to drink milk, you're so full of shit. You don't know what you're, what you're talking about. The gods, into, the gods graced the Indo, our Indo-European ancestors with the ability to digest lactic acid and from that we were able to drink cow's milk and cheese and butter and it gave us a tremendous edge in terms of nutrition because there's not only in things like raw milk tremendous healing uh, issues and digestive and proteins and everything else but it's also it gave them a source of protein for the winter so for instance like having cows and cattle was very expensive not everyone could afford it but you could afford cheese and you could have a big cheese that would keep over the winter that would provide you your, your yellow meat for the winter it was meat so you know that this this nonsense you hear vegans and also truters as well there's thick fuckers they're not saying oh we were never meant to drink cow's milk bollocks the, the actual gods inter, in, interjected and made us a, gave us the ability. And that's why the, we worshipped cows. That's why cows, were, in, in Ireland especially, the cow and cattle were so central to the cultures, still are to this day. Now, that was the May Queen speech, you know, my darlings, okay? And, uh, you know, I'm taking off my tiara, and I'm taking off my, my my frock, you know, and I'm looking fabulous, right? And now dressed like a man, right? So the, the May Queen drew it, it's gone, okay? That was, a, that's a, an excellent segue into the conspiratorial part of this video, okay? One of the things that makes me very, very proud to be an analyst of conspiracies, an indulger of conspiracy theories, and someone who has no problem when people say you're into conspiracies, I take that with a great sense of pride when they say that, is because I, I and people like me, and many of you out there, are the only people who are doing the job that journalists are supposed to do. 
old-fashioned journalists were by nature the original conspiracy theorists. They, if they had a hunch regarding a story, they'd follow the leads. And this is how they would work their way through investigating a story when you had real journalists. I'm not going to be like David Yallop and people like that. We don't have real journalists today, mainly because in the past, journalists tended to be working class. They were from working class communities and they, 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 if they weren't from working class, they served in the war, in military and wars and stuff like that. Like George Orwell was in the Spanish Civil War, Hemingway, that kind of thing. And they had combat experience, or if they didn't have combat experience, they worked on building sites, they worked in shit jobs. And that was real journalism. That's where journalism came from. These were hard-nosed, hard-drinking, womanizing, chain-smoking, who could go into the toughest neighborhoods, deal with the most darker subjects and the most nitty-gritty aspects and then follow a lead, a conspiracy, and upon that, test all the criteria along the way, like I do, and I might look and say something, and say, that's okay, here's a conspiracy, go, that's a lot of bullshit, I'm not interested in that. Or I follow, oh, there's something here, well, maybe do somewhere else. That's And that was journalism. And that's what we do today. That's what people like me do today. I do the job that you're, the, the, the The issue with journalists today is they're all middle class namby pambies who never had a day of hardship in their life, have no, oh, wow, uh, that's cool. A stoat just ran across. I've never seen a stoat. Oh, it's lovely. I'm getting real beltane. A stoat just ran across the road. And uh, it's, uh, I've never seen a stoat like that in the wild. I'm not running across the road. I've seen them in fields, but lovely animals. But uh, yes, so they were ha the ones today are Namby Pambies. Namby Pambies. Dog a stoat! <laughs> Namby Pambies. And uh, they've no life experience. They went to f their four years in university or college. They were brainwashed by their university professor who was a a Marxist sex freak, no doubt, and who told them that the purpose of a journalist is to take government, corporate, and university press releases and simply copy and paste them into a newspaper. So they have no investigative abilities. They have no... They have no skill sets to allow them to investigate, to follow a lead. They are simply copy and paste merchants that's all they are and uh, one of the reasons journalists hate not only conspiracy theorists like me and and also bloggers they hate bloggers as well is because deep down inside all these journalists know that they're fucking phonies they're just glorified secretaries they did their four years in university to become a glorified secretary. Here's a memo from the boss. The boss being a university uh, department, a government department, or a corporate press office. Here, retype this as it is. That's what journalists do today. And the only time they show any zeal is when they're told to attack people that they call conspiracy theorists. Because it's really based on jealousy. Because they're so jealous that we can follow leads on stories this is why when someone says you're into conspiracies you, you wear that with a badge of pride because all the great journalists of the past all were uh all great investigators you know what what the hell is sherlock holmes he was a conspiracy theorist for folks sake you know he, he got a hunch he followed it and he elementary dear watson you know said and if something was bullshit he discarded it i thought of something else so you know you're coming from a very long noble line what the, the journalists today come from nothing except their uh, brainwashing factories. So you remember that. So, as I said, I started off with the first part of the show. Uh, the tiara is off, and I'm now a man again. Oh, I got a, I got, I woke up with a barge pole in my underpants this morning. Oh, I'm a man now, right? And uh, so we have had a discourse. I have to choose my words very carefully now. We have had a discourse on this channel and my other channel, Thomas Sheridan, too, since the assault on national governments declared full spectrum warfare upon their populations in April 2020. And we went from Operation Jabberwocky. I'm using the, the, the catchphrases to keep trying to keep my channel up. Operation Jabberwocky 
to Operation Russian Man Bad. And along the way, they assaulted the, the battles. The battle tactics were pretty straightforward. There was siege warfare and terror tactics at the first at the beginning, and then ordinances uh, ordinances were fired that were biochemical weapons that were shot at the citizenry by their own government under the guise of the transubstantiation of the sacred needle craft. Right? It was it was biological warfare. They didn't didn't do anything else, and. Uh, weakened immune systems uh, that was specifically targeted at people that were very expensive for healthcare departments to take care of the elderly cancer patients diabetics people with cirrhosis of the liver uh, people with hiv very and also very potentially expensive clientele for the revenue and just like any business model they had to cut costs and so they used these ordinances these biochemical weapons under the guise of the transubstantiation or also, also coronary patients as well heart transplants are very expensive for insurance companies and everyone else and they all want to cut costs or your public health service for, for you know government's revenue and they need that money for themselves. So they use these ordinances, these these rockets, these transubstantiation, these biochemical rockets, rockets, as the transubstantiation of the sacred needlecraft to take them out first. So that's why, well, you know the story. And the ones that were left were then, in order to, in order to deteriorate the immune system further, they launched operation russian you know i don't know babushka bitch bad an operation babushka bitch bad put the rest of them who were already health compromised into a more difficult place and what happens when your your mental and psychological state deteriorates well your kinetic energy and your body and your and your health and your ability to fight maladies deteriorates as well oh we're dancing between the log between the algorithms today and uh, this phase the second phase operation babuska bitch that will come to a sudden end with a peace talks and I'm telling you right now to get ready for the third phase of, of this military assault upon the citizenry by its own government. And when I say own governments, I'm not just talking about your politicians. I'm talking all the way down to your, the local civil servant because they're all getting pay raises because they're going to be the inner party and the stormtroopers coming after you. They need them to protect the ones at the top to roll out the agenda so what is the next stage of the operation all the national papers in europe and you'll see it in other countries too have said that we have to kill x amount of livestock in the fields in order to meet our climate change targets this is a lie let me introduce or reintroduce should i say professor neil ferguson do you remember about 18 years ago the foot and mouth thing in the uk who was the one who implemented that mass sacrificial ritual that was professor neil Ferguson, Professor Niels Ferguson, was running a test to see how food supplies in the UK would collapse and how quickly 
when this happened. And boy, did they collapse really quickly. I was over in the UK just after it happened. And I was talking to people who worked in and ran restaurants and stuff like that. And they said if it hadn't have been for the that they were able to import Irish beef, chicken, dairy, uh, dairy and muffin, sheep meat, lamb, there would have been no meat in the UK. It was only because Ireland produces a vast amount of food way beyond what we need and we export most of it. Irish farmers are very good at producing food. That's it, the real talent we have in this country. And so that was a test run to see how quickly the stocks would deplete. And I was just talking to people at the time were telling me there was literally a point where you had steakhouses or burger places were on a point of closing because it was only, they were rescued at the last moment by Irish exporters. And ever since then, Ireland has been ostensibly feeding the UK in terms of that, in terms of meat and dairy. You know, that's, you know, processed milk is a huge export to the UK from Ireland. And butter, everyone needs, everyone in England needs dairy gold and that kind of thing. And Irish cheeses are very common there as well. So the test run was successful. They got the data for their new models. See, they're all about modeling and data. Then he became, uh, switch forward, of the data modeler for the ping pong. And he predicted colossal numbers of non people, will become non people, units. See, they've reduced their, they've re what was it Stalin said, one death is a, a tragedy. A million deaths is a statistic. Well, that's that's the world that Neil Ferguson operates in. He doesn't believe anything he says, and that was proven by the fact that he went to see his lady for the sweet love. You know, you know. Could you imagine what that sex was like? Uh, tell, tell me. Tell, uh, quote statistical references to me. Uh, Ooh, that the modeling uh, this kind of thing uh, Excel spreadsheets uh. and uh, that was that been like but anyway his private life's his own business I don't care I didn't care about that part I don't give a shit about other people's private lives but uh, to me the fact that he did that during the height of the sequestering of mankind when no one else was allowed to travel more than 1.5 kilometers Professor Neil Ferguson travelled across, right across Britain, just like lots of politicians did in every country, because they all knew it wasn't real. And then you said to the meat, to the meat golems, and to Joe Normie, does that not prove to you that they're not afraid of it? And that does not prove to you they're not afraid because it isn't a danger? And they went, hmm. 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 Mm. 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 Right. And then they lo they they lined up for the ordinances to be fired at them. Execution of style And that was that to quote uh, Nick Cave in the Bad Seeds. And well now we're in stage three of the Buried them better thing. And it is food supply. The war in the Ukraine has created a disaster for them. I'll tell you why. Those of you who are going on about Putin is one of them, you're wrong. I don't think he is. I think he called their bluff. They did not expect him to do this, and he's a very clever and a dangerous bastard. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not singing his praises, and but he's a clever bastard. He knew he would kill two birds with one stone, cut off Germany's energy supply, and also Ukraine is the biggest grain producer in Europe. 
Now you say to yourself, well, it's only wheat. It'll just be bread and beer and things like that. No. That, they also produce cattle feed. And you go to your farmer's co-op anywhere in Western Europe and you see those big, what they call peanuts, they're like food pellets. They're all made from, from grain that's grown in the Ukraine. So there's no cattle field. So basically the animals are looking at mass starvation. The cows and the sheep particularly. Good quality sheep. Not these things that like run around the mountains. They're in bits. If you look at them. They look like uh, they look like they look. They don't, they don't even look like what sheep anymore. The feral ones in the hills. I'm talking about like a, the proper good quality sheep around the fields that are used for meat and wool, and uh, they can't feed them. So they have to make up an excuse. So they say it's because their farts are destroying the ozone there or some shit like that. So we have to kill them all, or else we won't replace them when you eat them. So, you remember I said a video about castration cults always arise before something big, big comes? And the castration cults are at their mass now. So, start stocking food. If you're a vegan, I, I don't know what you're going, how you're going to survive. I really don't. I don't. Good luck. You have my condolences. Vegetarians, you can stock cheese. Hopefully you will eat eggs and fish, some of you. Tinned fish. Does he can eat tinned fish? Uh, protein in terms of milk. Fats can be stored in things like tins of condensed milk. Well, that stuff in the supermarket. Stock up on pastas. There's, there's, it's like for instance a, a chain in Ireland called Super Value in a, in a black bag are selling a very high quality Durham wheat pasta from Italy for 80, 89 to 99 cents for a, for a bag of the different shapes tremendous value a proper, a proper Durham wheat fat pasta don't buy that Roma crap that's all yellow that don't, look, the best pasta is the whitest pasta if you look at all the high quality pastas from Italy, the really good ones, they're snow white, the noodles are snow white in the box or bag. The yellow, the dark yellowy ones are crap. They're full of soy. That's all soy in there. So get yourself, like if you live in Ireland, if you live in, and look for the white colored discount pasta that's made with proper Durham wheat. And it has very, it doesn't have the high gluten content. Tin fish. Tinned meats, especially, last for years and years. This is not going to last for years and years. It might last. What it won't be. There won't be no food. It's just what food is there. It's going to be very, very expensive. So that's going to be very, very expensive. Okay, not all of it. You know, it'll be it'll be a weird kind of thing. It'll be like the lockdown. You still have lots of money to buy things. You will find that like you won't have the money to buy f the food that you once found abundant but there'll be lots of money to buy shit on Amazon it'll be it'll be a weird fucking non-linear warfare oh dear Adams you know that kind of thing you know and uh, so you know that's the thing uh, protein especially if you garden that's great but remember gardening is not unless you live in Mediterranean it's tricky Okay, you can't, you know, and even if you have a polytunnel, and, so, and, you, you, and you have to remember that you're expending a lot of energy when you garden. So you might not be able to grow in a climate like this, even with a polytunnel. This the adequate amount of calories and nutrients you need to compensate for the expending of the energy you used in growing the vegetables and harvesting them and so on. So always remember that. This is why even if you're a, a really good, and I know some people who are going to like, they can grow fucking broccoli out of their ear hole and you know they're really good they've got they've really got those green fingers you still got to be stocking up on the pa you go to the pakistani and indian shops and you can buy things like they, they they still have cans and tins that don't have the pop tip don't, don't think they pull can thing they're the worst for storing they're the worst get cans that are open with an opener and remember to make sure there are plenty of openers and uh and don't forget, you know, and so like proteins, 
don't get tin, tin tomato anything and that includes baked beans are tricky as well and if you do have baked beans just for safety's sake store them in a completely different container and even go through the trouble of putting each can in. that's what i do you know that if i'm any way a bit nervous about like i bought some beautiful american baked beans that was on sale on some discount shop great place to find this stuff by the way because a lot of that stuff is army army rationing that's relabeled for the market to be sold in the the surpluses they don't sell to the military they put labels on them and sell them to the discount stores I get a Ziploc bags, they're very inexpensive, and I will put each individual can of anything I feel a bit might be a bit tricky or acidic inside the Ziploc bag and I seal it. So that way if something like it does have a high tomato content like minestrone soup or something like that, tomat, tin tomatoes, and it, it burns through the metal seal, or uh, it won't spoil the other food, it'll just go bad in the, in the, in the bag. So anything that's in danger of leaching and corrupt things but don't have don't have cans of tin tomatoes next to all your other stuff because if they leach if the acid burns through the can it'll destroy your other stuff if you're a bit nervous about a can that might have a high acidic content just put it in ziploc bag and seal the zip you know squeeze all the air out of it and seal the ziploc bag and put that in the container I, I haven't had a problem yet but i've heard horror stories from others who bought bulk warehouse tins of tomatoes and they all spoiled because one can burst and leaked and rotted the others uh, don't forget salt you die without salt this is you die without salt and pepper you don't die without pepper you die without salt but grab peppers as black pepper as well and your little jars of herbs and stuff that help cooking make it better you won't be living in the coal trying to cook your dinner over a candle you'll still have like all the mod cons that you'll have your internet and everything you'll just find food expensive and but that you know that's so it's not going to be like survival where it's only one you're not going to have no water you're not going to have no electricity there might be power cut offs because of the russian thing but it won't be like all the time what you're going to find is you see food a food by making food by food becoming very expensive it becomes food cut off food supply by default you know what i mean it's by default that happens because you can't afford it you know you can't you're not going you know what sick you know there's some the rich can afford it but you know how many of us are going to walk to the supermarket and say, you know 5.99 for a box of pasta that's what we're heading for that kind of thing you're going to find bread is a difficult one too as well you're going to have to deliver it out of now you know there's all kind you know, remember prepping don't be what so many of these prepping channels on youtube will, are, are so misleading they're they make it sound like you need to be a scientist and to and have all this equipment to prep no you don't plastic containers with a snap tight lid on them will, will hold your food for it forever literally if it's if it's you know well for you know very long times keep it dry and keep it away from rodents dog is rats but uh I'll be rat's dog maybe that one. And um and you're alright, okay? And it's not going to be the rest of your life, it'll be for maybe a year, maybe six months. And then things will things will then normalise with the next not this harvest in the Ukraine, but the next one. So be prepared for food prices to go through the roof and as a result food shortages not by a necessarily a complete lack of food although that will exist but by just because monetary constraints on your own personal living standards okay and that's it no need to be panicking no need to watch these prepping channels where they use hermetic sealed drums of grains and they have their own milk no you don't need that buy just buy fucking rice from tilde in remember buy things that are in sealed bags and then wrap everything up in black plastic bin liner black plastic garbage bags hefty sacks you call them in america the black ones keep sunlight off them and then put them in the, the container that you buy from your storage shop your stationary store or whatever and snap the clip the top and then put that away and you'll feel better okay you'll feel a lot better and things like chocolates even store you want to give yourself some treats as well and uh if you're a vegan, I don't know. I don't know how you'll survive at all. 
I can't think. I can't think of it. Remember, it's like the vegan lifestyle in the West is built upon affluence. You know what happened? You know, if you can't afford bread, what's going? What does that mean for your kumquats and all these like your mangoes? You know, if this there'll also be fuel issues as well. So even things like that transported from overseas, like mangoes and stuff. So my suggestion to you vegans is to start to uh, start learning to learn learning the learning why your ancient ancestors worshipped the cow because it saved their asses and it will save yours so that's not a negative and depressing message by the way i don't do doom porn i do contingency and i'm i'm generally positive so remember this one easiest thing in the world it's not a panic thing it's not a something to like live in fear of it's just like your answer your your your, your great grandparents would have lived like this all the time you know you know oh jesus there's a there's a war in the crimea i would do a war in the crimea between the uh between the russians the english and the ottomans and uh jesus we did we, 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 we hard getting food now down the dock so uh, we better we better stock up on a few things in the pantry See, you see, it's not. And you don't, don't be listening to the guy going Ezekiel twelve twenty five. You know, I'll do. Barry Gilmore here. Christian Wilder, Lynchburg, Tennessee. Ah, you know, I haven't been making, I haven't been making the videos on the Zog tube for a while. Because I've been dealing with uh, some personal issues, I have, I have fallen from grace. I have, I have fallen from from grace. I, I, I went back to drinking in the drug again, even though I had made a note to my God, Ezekiel twenty four sixty five. Those who Eat from the lamb, shall benefit from the cane nuts and their ways. I I I, I went drinking and drug again, and, and 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 it all happened when I came home and I I found my two hundred fifty six wife, Brulila, and she was having the sexual intercourse with catfish. Who's the old Satan? And I walked in and I said, Why are you fucking I will not use profanity? Why why are you falling a kitten with my brulita? And sh and she says, Well, he real man. He 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 he's a pagan. He I don't believe that Bible shit no more. Well I almost almost I will not use profanity. I almost died. I almost died, and so, God, but I, the Lord was testing me. The Lord was, the Lord was testing me. Okay, by putting old and Satan catfish in my bed in my trailer home, fornicating with my brother. I, 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 I made a decision that I was going to have to walk away, and I said. To my son, Ezekiel, Elijah, Leviticus, that this is happening because of Zog. This is happening because of Zog. And my woman, she has now been taken in by the catfish as the old Satanist. And and this old Satan is to do with is to do with Zog. Turning people on Lynchburg away from the path of the Lord. So I went, I went, I, I'm making this up as I go along by the way, so it doesn't that funny. I, I, I went and said, I, I'm going to, I'm going to crusade. I'm going to crusade to make up for falling from grace from the Lord. And I went to the Ukraine to fight against the the reds the 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 riskies, but the fight for the good 
Christian people of the Ukraine against Zag. So I, I get to the Ukraine, no, and I, I said, I want to fight Zag. And there was these Ukraine guys, and they had swastikas all over them, and they said, oh, that's good, because we want to fight Zag too. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. And so they they said, do you see that field over there? And I said, yeah. Well, they said, Barry, if you walk in that field, you draw it out the sniper fire. And I said, won't I get shot? And they says, well, you might get shot, but you'll die for the Lord and the fat zog. So I said, well, I might as well do it. So I went down to the field and I got lost because it, Ukraine is not like Tennessee. It's, not, it's different, okay? And next thing I know, I'm arrested by these 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 Russians, okay? These Russians, godless Zarg Russians, okay? And the Russian officer, he comes up to me and he says, "What kind of man are you?" And I says, "What do you mean? What kind of man am I? I'm I'm a Christian American and I'm here to fight Zarg." And he says, you stupid. This is not your war. And I says, every war that the Lord is fighting is my war. So he put a gun in my mouth. He put a, the Russian version of a, of a revolver. A revolver in my mouth. And he said, I should fucking shoot you right now. And I says, Oh, Jesus! Oh, Jesus Christ! Take me into your arms! Take Barry Drumar into your arms! I I am willing to be a Martha against Zog! And, and he said, I'm not going to shoot you. And I said, the Lord saved me! And he said, because you're such a f fucking... I will not use profanity! You're such... You would be a waste of a bullet. A waste of a bullet. So he, he just put me on a bus with these other people who went to fight for Zog. And we ended back up in the Ukrainians place. And then I'm back in Lynchburg. So I've done my bit fighting. And I'm now ready to face my 247th wife, Barilla. And catfish Odin Satan for what they did. But the real reason I'm here to talk to you, Bert Drumor here, is to talk to you about prepping. I have done much prepping. Now, as you've seen my YouTube videos, prepping for Christ against Sarg, you'll see that I I I use hermetically seed barrels using ozone gas retractors to store grain. My prepping tools cost $84,000 because I'm doing it right. But but this devil man, devil man Sheridan in, in Ireland, Zogland, Zogland, he says you don't need to spend $85,000 on specialist equipment to prog. To, to rip. But you do if you're fighting Zog. So it's different for me. So you see with Barry. So when you see those YouTube channels. Where you have these American preppers on them. Like Barry Drewmore. And they have spent a fortune. On this specialized equipment. To prep. You don't need to do that. That's totally. They're totally misleading videos. And they overcomplicate things. Just create a pantry, garden, if you have a garden, and learn about wild foods, the dandelions and all the other stuff are coming up now, okay? And I'll see you in the beauty to come. Beltane blessings, Yopan, long live the horn gods.